Welcome back to part four of our series. We've touched on the epidemic of cardiometabolic disease, which encompasses cardiovascular disease and metabolic conditions, including type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We've also discussed early identification of these conditions and touched on why early identification and risk stratification of these conditions are so important. Dr. Jesse Sorolia is back with me today to discuss the how. How do we use laboratory insights to identify disease earlier and risk stratify our patients? Welcome back, Jesse. I'm excited to talk about the how today. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. Jesse, so we've covered insulin resistance, IR panel with score, um, but I wanted to change gears um, and focus on laboratory insights specifically for chronic kidney disease. Uh, before we get into laboratory insights, I thought it would be beneficial for the audience and our listeners to review some CKD basics, a huge topic. So let's define CKD. So what is the definition of chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is often defined as any anomaly with the kidney structure or the function uh, that's been going on for more than three months. I believe like when I'm thinking about kidney disease, I'm looking at a GFR drop below 60 usually is like when I'm starting to pay a little bit more attention as this increases risk for cardiometabolic disease and stained renal disease, mortality, I think it's a huge problem. It's super under-recognized, under-diagnosed, and I'm glad we're having an opportunity to talk about it. So I think it's key to get that definition down. Um, and kind of following up on another statement you made, it is shocking to look at statistics related to CKD and the very little progress that we've made over the past few decades, right? Shocking. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. You know, when you think nine in 10, 90% of individuals with CKD don't even know they have it, um, really makes a clinician, any clinician step back and think, okay, what am I missing here? Um, how can we improve this? To make early identification a reality in CKD, it's important to know um, and for our listeners to understand what populations are at highest risk. So what are the risk factors for CKD? What populations are at highest risk? Obviously, the big ones we think of are diabetes and hypertension. That's two thirds of chronic kidney disease cases. But there are other risk factors, um, family history of chronic kidney disease, certain ethnicities, previous kidney damage, systemic diseases like lupus, uh, age above 65, smoking, frequent medication use. Um, there's also increased risk for people that are moderately obese. Um, and that's another reason, again, for early detection and early identification that might not fit that normal chronic kidney disease picture that we've kind of created in our mind. Yeah, this perceived idea of a person at risk for CKD, it may have plagued uh, many of the providers listening today, because I think, you know, that perceived idea is a diabetic patient, right? I mean, that's all that is, you know, drilled us into us in school that we're screening diabetics for chronic kidney disease. When you know, in your list that you're reviewing, there are so many other populations that are at risk. Yeah. So the perceived idea of chronic kidney disease, um, when we do think of diabetes, I think like you had mentioned, it's been drilled into us, but I also think that it's um, a quality measure, right? And so we're like, we have to screen for chronic kidney disease and diabetics uh, or we're not screening and people with hypertension, two thirds are hypertension and diabetes. So it's not just diabetes in that two thirds. All right. Well, we're breaking some molds today here, Jesse. So we are identifying uh, other populations at risk. So we've covered definition, we've covered risk factors and populations at risk. What about testing? What should we be assessing when we're evaluating for chronic kidney disease? So I think the one that comes to mind, of course, is your GFR and your creatinine. But I think the one that we also need to really consider is the urine albumin creatinine ratio. And we do that well with diabetics. We don't always do that well with other populations. Yeah, that's a huge point. I hope that our listeners grasp um, is that there's two parts to CKD evaluation. You know, obtaining both an eGFR and that urine albumin creatinine ratio. When you look at guidelines, right? So the kidney disease improving global outcome guidelines, Professional entities like the National Kidney Foundation all are advocating to assess 
both markers when you're evaluating CKD. So why is this? Why do we have to evaluate both markers? Well, essentially, they're telling us two different stories, right? So they're telling, each are telling us a different component. When you look at GFR, that's speaking to kidney function. Um, it also helps us determine the stage of kidney disease. When you look at urine albumin creatinine ratio, that is assessing for kidney damage, right? So albumin should not be in the urine. Um, so again, these tests tell us different components when uh, we're looking at chronic kidney disease. Why do you think clinicians are solely relying on EGFR and leaving out the albumin creatinine ratio? You know, when you look at statistics of, um, you know, how often providers are checking that portion or that, um, you know, component of the urine albumin creatinine ratio, there's huge gaps. Um, so why do you think that is? I think part of it is the idea that it's not necessary maybe in patients that are not diabetic because we'll catch it eventually. And so what, maybe I think part of it is once we get those results back, where do we go from there? At what point do we refer? At what point do we treat? At what point should our, um, concern get higher? How often should we screen it? Should it be just annually? So I don't think that, um, maybe guidelines for that are as clear, or maybe as widely published or, maybe disseminated, you know, that might be part of it as well. Um, so I think that there's a lot of reasons maybe why we're not doing it. Maybe the concern is coverage. Maybe if they're not diabetic, is this test going to get covered? But keeping in mind that some of these tests are not expensive. And if it's something that's going to be beneficial to your patient, it's probably worth doing. Thinking again, preventatively. So if we're catching damage before function changes, we're going to benefit our patients. Yeah, great points. I mean, I think you bring up some some keys here, right? Essentially not knowing that these are incorporated into guidelines, right? That both of these are com components and it's the ease of access of understanding guidelines. Um, also, you know, the point about um, where to go next, when to refer, right? So what levels should you be thinking of involving a specialist? All questions that um, I think have potentially past providers' minds. Um, so again, all great points. Uh, I want to highlight um, the kidney profile. So it's, uh, Quest recently released this test, um, test code uh, 39165, to assist in addressing a lot of the concerns that you brought up, right? Or, or a lot of the potentials of why this gap exists. So this incorporates EGFR and urine albumin creatinine ratio. Um, the goals of this report was really to assist providers in identifying and getting patients treated for CKD at earlier stages to hopefully prevent and delay outcomes. The enhanced reporting offered by the kidney profile has many different features that answers questions regarding staging, referral, and additional testing that may be needed. So as you can see from the sample report on your screen, the kidney profile provides a summary in addition to testing recommendations dependent on the CKD stage, and even goes into additional recommendations of frequency of monitoring and when the patient should be referred. So that gives a little bit um, of a visual representation of what the kidney profile report or that enhanced report that it offers um, and the additional information that it provides to providers. How are you utilizing it in clinic? So how are you um, utilizing um, the kidney profile and how do you find this report to be beneficial in clinical practice? So I think this is a great annual test. So I think the kidney profile should be used for patients with diabetes and hypertension annually. I also think that uh, the idea of testing other high-risk populations as stated before is also going to be really important. The idea of preventing disease and preventing disease progression is so important. This test in particular also gives you an idea of next steps, which when, every time I'm thinking about patients, I'm thinking past, present, future. So we're looking at them now, but we want to make sure we're looking ahead two, three, four steps. And this test really does help us to do that as well. It's also helping us to maybe um, pay more attention to patients that might be more disenfranchised. So if we're thinking African-Americans, they're four times more likely to develop CKD and end up on dialysis. My goal is always to prolong life, prolong quality of life, and ultimately reduce incidence altogether. So you talk about 
next steps? Is this kind of like a cheat sheet for providers and like what you need to do? Uh, Yeah, I definitely think this gives you such a good clue on where you should go. So it's breaking down the stages, which I don't know if uh, you noticed on the graph that we're now not just saying three, we have three A, three B, which may be treated differently. Um, It's also telling us when to pay more attention to things like potassium, when to maybe consider um, adjusting medications. So I think it really does give a provider that might be like, well, now I've done this test. Now what? It, it helps you. Like there's, it, there is an outlet on there for you. Which is great. I mean, I think that really, you know, providers are so busy and, you know, I think one of the greatest parts is that it organizes information about those questions, common questions that you have. What other labs do I need to be doing? What stage is this? Um, you know, what do I need to be doing in regards to monitoring? I mean, you mentioned, yes, annual testing for these high risk populations, but depending on the score, you may need to engage in testing more often than annually. And that heat map um, at the bottom really gives you indications for that. And then referral. Another one, another point that we talked about um, earlier in our conversation was, you know, not testing because you don't necessarily know where to go next or when to refer. Um, this allows that clear um, pathway to do that. So helpful to point that out. I, I appreciate that. Jesse, thanks again for joining me. It's always a pleasure. Um, thank you for bringing your expertise. Thank you for bringing your clinic experience of utilizing these diagnostics for our listeners. Thank you again for having me. It's been such a pleasure and I've just enjoyed the opportunity to help educate others and bring more information to other clinicians. Well, I have enjoyed um, my time with you and I'm sure our listeners can, can definitely say the same. Thanks again. 